Hey, welcome. It's time to meet our community, the Hispanic business community here in Orange County. Powered by the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beal Applied Innovation Center with a rare guest today here. We're, we're the second happiest place on earth, I think, here today because of our guest. Woohoo! <laughs> I think you're right. Hey, thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, Ruben Franco, President and CEO of the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we enjoy everyone being on our podcast because uh, our community is your community. We want to introduce you to what we do in the community. So we have a great guest today, a very special guest. We have Ken Potrock, the president from Disneyland Resort. Uh, Ken has uh, been a, a great advocate for uh, what they do there at Disneyland, and we're looking forward to hearing some of the great things they have going on and finding out a little bit about Ken himself and uh, everything else. So we look forward to uh, having this discussion. And Ken, thank you very much for uh, joining us today. First thing we'd like to pretty much ask all of our guests is just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, Ruben, it's great to be here, and thanks for having me. So how do you tell somebody you know, about yourself? I would start with family. I have uh, two sons, both adults. One's in college and one's in the computer science field. And I have a wife that's an actress and we have a very happy life. And we are really loving being in California. We moved here a little over four years ago from Orlando, Florida. And I have fallen in love with California lifestyle and really all that California has to offer. Well, welcome to California. We appreciate you. uh, Thanks. Great. you, You being here. And where did you grow up? So I was born and raised in the Bronx. My family was pretty typical immigrant story. My mom was from Poland. My dad was from Russia. They're, they were born there, and I'm first generation, my sister and I. You know, how do you make a living? How do you support your family? And so my family was in the initially the bakery business and then the restaurant business and, and made a lives for ourselves. Uh, you know, my dad's goal was always about education and how do I make sure that my kids are really well educated and you know one deli sandwich at a time he was able to fund our way to you know really great schools and great degrees so i'm really proud of both my mom and dad and it's a great story a lot of great immigrant stories that you tell and what we tell our people that we get to hear from here on our podcast as well so that's awesome i think you told me briefly before when we were talking that when you grew up in the bronx the deli or the bakery was 50 yards from the old Yankee Stadium. Yeah, I have so many memories, Ruben. In any of these kind of families, everybody works, right? right? And even when I was five or six years old, I remember literally being propped up on a on a, a chair in the bakery located right on what's called 161st Street and Jerome Avenue, 50 yards from the stadium. And I would be there working, you know, as a six-year-old. I was putting... You know, those bakery boxes, I was putting those bakery boxes together. I got paid a penny a box. Over about a two-hour period, I could knock off about 100 of them, get my buck, you know, and I was rich. I think that was a a, a big deal. And throughout the day, famous Yankees would be coming by from the, at that time, the 60s, coming into the bakery to, to buy their bread or their pastries, and, you know, I'm walking out, and I would sit there and talk to them and get autographs from them. And, you know, honestly, we didn't think much of it because they were just part of the neighborhood. Right. Who was your favorite Yankee? Who was my favorite Yankee? I would probably say Roger Maris, if you begin thinking about, you know, sort of the history of it. But there were so many guys that came in that were really kind to me, you know, and it was like, like I became part of the sort of thread of, you know, the Bronx. And that was really fun. And when did you move out of the Bronx, I guess? We left in the, I'm going to call it the late 60s. And, you know, again, funny story, but, you know, we got robbed a couple of times. Oh. And my dad was like, I've had enough of this. And he had a family member located in, of all places, Akron, Ohio. And they went into business together and started a delicatessen restaurant and bakery and catering operation, which was there for 35 plus years. It became a stalwart of the community. So... That was the shift from New Yorker to Midwesterner, and it was, you know, a really great transition for us. It was a great place to grow up. Wow. So you've lived on the East Coast. You've lived in Middle America, which is, I think, I think in Ohio. Yeah. There's like yep. within 500 
mile radius that's half the country, right? Right. And then now you're here in California, so you've gotten to see... Uh, and I had a stint in Florida, so... Oh, and that's right. And you I went, got south, too. Before you got here with Disneyland Resort, you, right. were, you were in Orlando as well. Well, we can go into that a little bit as well. So I'm very confused, basically. Yeah, I would think so. That's covering a lot of the uh, of the country. So how did you get your start with Disney? I mean, your career, you've been there 28 years, is that 28 correct? 28 years. Okay. So what, what did you first do when you got uh, to Disney? Well, I applied for a job. I got called by a recruiter that said, hey, we have this job available at Disney. Would you be interested in it? And I asked what the job was, and they go, well, they're starting this new business. The business was Disney Cruise Line, oh, and we're looking okay. for somebody to come in and head up marketing and head up product development. And I had done, obviously, a lot of marketing because I was coming from the ad agency business and marketing consulting, and I hadn't done a lot of development, but seemed like a good fit. And after 17 interviews and seven months of interviewing, I finally got the job. And it was a, a slog to get there, but it was a great place to start and a great business to start on. And then where did you go from there with, with Disney? I mean, you started, you started with the cruise line, and that was, that was new. And that's based in Orlando, correct? Uh, based out of Orlando, right. headquarters right. was there, but sailing all over the world. Right. So then I shifted after a period of time to marketing for Disney World, then marketing for Disney World and Disneyland, and then marketing for all of our parks around the world, which was great because I got to see the differences. Yeah. I got to learn a little bit more about bicoastal. I got to learn a lot more about international and global. So that became a really great assignment. And then after sort of a culmination of about 10 years – a number of my mentors came to me and said, hey, listen, if you want to keep moving up in the organization, you got to start running some things. Mm. And, and I go, well, I'm, I'm ready to go. What, what do you want me to run? And so the first thing they came to me with was our sports business, which was at the time called Disney's Wide World of Sports. And it's an amateur professional sports complex based in Orlando. And it was, you know, losing money and it was not doing well and... And that really began sort of my journey of taking on assignments that were less than optimal, yeah. challenged, broken, uh, whatever sort of nomenclature you want to put against it. And I found that to be my niche. So Disney's Wide World of Sports quickly became ESPN Wide World of Sports. We did a deal together with ESPN, which was part of the company. We changed kind of who the target was. We shifted away from professional and into amateur we quickly realized that you know the young girl or the young boy playing in a soccer or volleyball tournament was going to come down they were going to play their tournament they were going to go to the theme parks they were going to bring their mom and dad and sister and brother and grandparents and there became a really interesting business for us and it hadn't been operating that way previously and so that was number one and then there were another half a dozen after that that became again well let's shift them over to the next broken business and the next business that's struggling, and the next business that needs to be reinvented. And that became sort of my brand. So Disneyland, you know, sort of became the most recent in that sort of journey. Yeah. And again, you would ask, how could Disneyland be broken? Disneyland's fantastic. It's iconic. It's symbolic. Well, Disneyland had closed 60 days previously for the pandemic. So it was about as broken as broken could be. We were not open. Right. That created a really unique opportunity to, to reinvent a business large as Disneyland and do it in a way that was both sensitive to the traditions of the past, but also cognizant of the challenges of the future. Well, I'm sure you learned a lot, obviously, with working on broken businesses and getting to that point of being the Disneyland Resort president. But there probably had to be some things that you w even weren't expecting when COVID hit and all that transpired. There must have been something that kind of just stuck out to you that was unexpected, even even with all the things happening. Well, the most unexpected thing, Ruben, is we were closed for 14 plus months. Yeah. You know, when I took the job, the assumption was that we were going to be closed for four weeks, you know, and then at the end of four weeks, we'd be back open We'd have all these health criteria that we needed to adhere to, but we'd be back open and operating. And month after month after month after month went by where we were still not open. And, and it became a very, very different kind of challenge. You know, yes, I get the fact that we were bleeding money, 
but that really wasn't the biggest concern, at least for me. The biggest concern is I had 32,000 people not working, you know, not getting a paycheck. And how do you think about that in terms of the impact on their homes, their families, their ability to pay rent, their ability to put food on the table, ability to send their kids to school? That was as heartbreaking a situation that as I'd ever been involved in. And, and it quickly morphed into our mission was simple, which was get our people back to work. Yeah. Well, we're, we're sitting on the campus of UCI, which I think is the second largest employer in Orange County. Disney's the first, number one. Um, and having to work with your cast members and do what you had to do over the past three years is just amazing. What are some of the things, like maybe you can explain a little bit about Disney Aspire, because that seems like a sure. really cool program. I'm not sure everybody knows about it, but I heard about it with uh, 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 Fran Vergy, our president over yeah. at Cal State Fullerton. and uh, but Who maybe, just announced his retirement. He just announced his retirement. Yeah. He's such a fun guy. He's a good guy. Uh, Fran is a really good guy. We're, we're very blessed here in Orange County to have great uh, yeah. educational leaders throughout the system, K-12, through community colleges, and our universities. Tell us a little bit about Disney Aspire and what what do you what do you guys hope to do with that with your employees? I mean, I think it's a, from what I hear, it's a great concept and a great opportunity because I've always believed that you need to keep continually learn. That's part of uh, who we are as people, and yeah. it makes you makes you stronger, makes you better as an employee or just as a person. So, tell us a little about it, about a spot, well, Disney. Aspire. Well, I'll give you a little bit of background and context first. You know, one of the things is any you know, business needs to do is how do you secure a workforce? You know, how do you make mm-hmm. sure that you're you're a preferred em- employer of choice so that the best talent wants to come work for you? And so when you begin to think about Disney, we had a number of things going for us, but we also had a number of things that weren't necessarily going for us. You know, what we had going for us was we're this iconic brand that people right. grew up with, especially here in Southern California. So there's a love and a passion for Disney. Then you begin thinking about things like, you know, people making a career here and and how do they make a career here as so that they move up sort of the demographic stair step process so that they're, you know, learning more, getting more challenges, making more money, you know, growing as anybody would do from a a young single person to a family person Mm -hmm. and as you go across that, that continuum. And so we began looking at why would people want to come here? Versus go somewhere else. And and so part of it is always compensation, right? So you've got to be competitive from a compensation perspective. And we, we work really hard to do that. But also part of it is what are the, the differentiators? What makes Disney different? And so you think about things like, you know, the medical programs and, and, and the benefits that come with it. We kept talking about the fact that we did not want to be positioned as low-paying jobs, How do you do that, especially if it's uh, people coming into the workforce maybe for the first time, and they are in entry-level jobs? And so we began looking at that saying, well, yes, we're going to be competitive within the world of entry-level jobs, but we also need to be able to create a career opportunity for these people that are coming in because they're talented, they're hungry, you know, and they want to do more. So Aspire was a natural because it became an opportunity to say, well, come here join our company and for full-time employees we'll pay for college for you whether you're doing college in a in a digital format and there's a number of schools that do that or you want to go to something like cal state fullerton or fullerton college where you want to do in-room classrooms we will pay in full for you to do that and by the way not based on you know what role you have today so you could be a housekeeper you're not going to go get a housekeeping major you know, you're right. going to go get a computer science major. Great. Yeah. We pay for that. You don't have to stay with the company for any length of time. So now all of a sudden, it's I can go get my education. And if I'm going to then go get another job with another company, good for you. We're really happy that we were able to develop that for you. But by the way, we hope that you find opportunities within our company right. and grow into management roles and grow into executive roles and grow into you know, you know, more innovative opportunities that, again, give you that career path. So Aspire is doing that, and we have literally thousands and thousands of our cast members that are uh, in this every single year and more all the time. Um, so a really exciting program and, again, an unbelievable competitive advantage 
in the what I'll call the acquisition and retention of our employee base of our cast members at Disneyland. Oh, that's that's phenomenal. That's a that's a great program because you you look at you know um, education is one of our pillars. Uh, obviously, as a chamber, uh, economic development, which is uh, really cool to talk to you, being uh, from a family of entrepreneurs, and how important that is to you. So all these things are you know resonate with us as, as yeah. a chamber. And the chamber was started. I don't know if everybody knows this was thirty seven years ago. This is our thirty seventh anniversary. Not quite as long as Disneyland, but but congratulations, but, still in order. But thank you. Yeah, it's it's it's, it's been a while. And uh, and Disney was there for us. You know, the first day you know, when when it was open. I wasn't there thirty seven years ago, but it was started by some entrepreneurs yeah. who just wanted some resources for their businesses, and and were able to do that and continue to build on that every year. But Disney was there for us. One of our, one of our, and always been one of our main members uh, going forward. So, why is it important uh, for Disney to work with the Chamber One and the Hispanic community? Yeah, I mean, I think it, it it goes, you know, you know, all the way to the beginning, you know, which is I thought, you know, Walt was pretty solid in terms of wanting to recognize that, you know, he wanted to entertain everyone. You know, there's a sign when you walk into the Disneyland park that says. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. Oh. And the emphasis is on the all. You know, all people are welcome. And one of the things you quickly realize in the Southern California marketplace and really the California marketplace is the gigantic stature that the Hispanic, you know, audience has, that the population has. And we can send, you know, you can look at that and see not only is it literally the new majority, but it is growing at a very, very rapid pace. And so unless we're engaged with the Hispanic audience and engaged being, you know, one, are we hiring, you know, Hispanic uh, uh, personnel, you know, for cast roles? Because our customers want to see people like that. Right. So that yeah. becomes an important component. Number two, you know, it is a family-driven culture and we are a family-driven company. So there's a good connection from that perspective. Number three, we want to continue to be relevant from a product and experience perspective. And so we bring on products, you know, whether it's from a film like Encanto or mm -hmm. something like that, or the, the shows and, and experience and characters that we portray. So you think about, you know, the Madrigal house. So you think about uh, uh, Coco, you think about uh, um, um, Ernesto, you think about all of these different kinds of things. They're all designed to make us relevant to a wide swath of audiences. And by the way, not just Hispanic, but black and African American, but Asian, but uh, uh, LGBTQIA. I mean, it just goes on and on right. in terms of relevancy. Back to to all who come to this welcome pl to all who come to this happy place. Welcome. welcome. Yeah. Focus on I, the all. Yeah, I love that uh, video. That was from Opening Day, right? Opening Day. Yeah. So, uh, and it's and it's about the shared experience, right? We get to we get to have when we you know I remember going here to Disneyland when I was five with my sisters and. Those pictures, and you remember those things. Those are things that you get to share with your your family. You remember, and you, you continue to do that. You guys are so good at at that, at the shared experience, at inspiring people to to uh, be close to family and just and, and and remember those precious moments that we have. Because well, Ruben, it's 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 interesting, and you know, you and I talked earlier last week about our families yeah. and, and backgrounds and all of that kind of stuff. One of the things that you see at Disneyland. And in fact, on Friday, you know, I was there and I spent a great deal of time with a multi-generational family. Yeah. And it's so fascinating because it's grandparents and it's the kids and it's the grandkids and, and they all have, you know, different things that they're necessarily interested in. But one of the things that you see unequivocally, and I was with a group of nearly 20 one of the things that you see unequivocally is it's all about family connections. Right. And Disneyland is a gathering opportunity. Even if they're going to go off and do different rides and shows, and they congregate back together because it's about family time together. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we got to uh, see you on video with the ribbon cutting, and you did a little, <laughs> uh, you little, little dance. Yeah. Uh, I don't um, know if you were thinking about yeah, it. I really have no rhythm. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was thinking. Yeah, I won't make a comment on that, but I don't know if you were thinking about an El you're a big Elvis fan, so I yep. don't know if you were thinking about an Elvis song at the time when you were when you were uh, shaking the hips. But, I was trying, but the hips don't move like they used to, Ruben. Yeah. Well, tell you mentioned Walt Disney. Um, I remember hearing what Walt used to do. He used to walk through the park and 
he was there almost every day. I think he was there, um, and that must have been really cool. And seeing some of the iconic pictures of him, black and white, and early morning, yep. uh, walking through the park. What's what's a day like for you? I mean, it's got to be just pretty exciting being president of Disneyland yeah. Resort. Well, I'll start with sort of the first comment and really try really hard to emulate Walt, you know, in that, you know, as leaders within our organization and really all my leaders within the organization are very much encouraged to spend time walking in the park, talking to our cast and talking to our guests. You can't know the business without doing that. You can't uh, understand the challenges and opportunities of the business unless you have those real-time listening posts. And those real-time listening posts are people. Yeah. So, like, get out there. Introduce yourself. You know, one of the things that, that um, we, we liked about the 100th anniversary, which we launched on Friday, was we gave new name badges to all of our cast members. And on the name badges, it says, you know, hey, Ken, right? And then underneath it, you could select your favorite character. Oh. And we did that consciously. And we haven't done that before. We did that consciously because those name badges are designed to be breakers. You, you know, how do you connect people? So, mm-hmm. so a guest comes up to me and says, okay, who's your favorite character? And they're looking, and they're like, Buzz Lightyear. And they like, why is that? That starts the conversation. You know, that begins the beginning of a relationship and a give and take where they're asking about me and then it gives me an opportunity to ask about them and what are they excited to see and, you know, you know why did they come here today and what's working and what's not working. I mean, it's market research. And by the way, it's just being human, Yeah. you know, and making those kind of connections. I got a lovely note uh, over the weekend from um, um, a guest who said that she was so thrilled with the experience that she had at Disneyland that it reminded her you know, of her childhood and how wonderful it was. And she was so happy that to her, it that felt that that wonder was still present. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's what we strive for. You know, it's, it's, it's not designed to be, you know, corporate and it's not designed to be, how can we figure out how to extract, you know, as much revenue out of people as we right. possibly can. It's designed to give people a memorable experience that's worth their investment of time mm. and treasure. And and that's what we try hard to do. We don't get it right 100% of the time, but we're working awfully hard to try to do yeah, that. Yeah, you do, you do a pretty good job at it, though, I must say. When my daughter was four, she's 25 now, but when she was four, we went on her birthday, and they do the little badge, and it says, you know, happy birthday, Lauren. Right. And there must have been like 20, 30 people that came up to her, cast members and others that just said, happy birthday, Lauren. And she was just beaming. She thought... The whole reason the park was open that day was for her. It was for her. I mean, she felt that. And by the way, that she should feel that. Yeah, and she certainly did, and we have pictures to prove it, and just uh, I'll never forget that day for her, her fourth birthday. So uh, pretty pretty amazing. What if a mouse could change the world? What, what does a, that mean to you? What a, what a great question. So I'm going um, to use a new show that we debuted on Friday as the example of that. And the show is called World of Color One. And it's a, a, a really exciting new presentation uh, at Ca- Disney's California Adventure that, that, that speaks to a number of different things using obviously Disney films and Disney dialogue and Disney heroes and heroines and all of that kind of stuff. But ultimately, the underlying message is it begins with a drop, a drop becomes a ripple. And a ripple becomes a wave of change. And one of the things that we want people to take away from that is the fact that they can have an impact on those around them, whether it's their family, their workplace, their community. And and I believe that kind of translates back to, you know, it it all began, you know, you know, you know, by a mouse. How do you think about the fact that 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 Mickey and Walt were that drop that then became that ripple, mm-hmm. that became that wave of innovation and imagination and the ability to dream and aspire. And, and so I, th- I think about it that way a lot. And I try to convey that, you know, even to my sons, you know, which is what difference can you make, not just, you know, in your career, but, you know, for your friends, for your family, and, and, and most importantly, for the community around you. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, it's pretty amazing that the... Uh Progression, right? That's 1923. 
100 years ago. Um, the park didn't open. Disneyland, which, which most people kind of uh, associate with Disney, right, is the, the park, at least I did as a kid. But there's so much more, right? So it's just like you go. We start with a mouse in 23, and 32 years later you have this really iconic yeah. theme park. And, you know, prior to that, you know, Walt had been doing movies and television and all that you know, stuff and still is at a very, very high level, you know, and just uh, families get to enjoy that. And uh, it's just uh, just amazing. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the 100-year – what do you guys have planned for this 100-year? Sure. Uh, well, you know, the one of the things that I thought was interesting is that the parks have always been a manifestation and really a next level of the films or television or mm-hmm. any of those things. So you can, you know, watch a TV show, you know, as a kid or as an adult – and there's a character there that you like. But to truly have an opportunity to bring them to life, now all of a sudden the dimensionality of a park experience is a whole different ballgame. Right. You know, so whether that's Star Wars Galaxy's Edge or Avengers Campus or you know, any number of, of sort of relevant experiences you know, that we have in the park, I think that becomes the differentiator. 100th anniversary marks the 100th anniversary of the company. So you think about what are the films that have happened, the TV shows that have happened, the innovations that have happened. But one of the most iconic things that have happened are the theme parks. And the one that started it all right. is the one right here in our backyard, you know, the Disneyland Resort. So we decided that while the entire company was going to celebrate the 100th anniversary, we were going to be the centerpiece. Mm-hmm. And we were going to do something that wasn't just for three weeks or – two months, we said, we're going to celebrate this for the entire year, and we're going to throw the kitchen sink at it. And that's exactly what we've done. So we have created, you know, what we think is a spectacular experience for people to join us in marking this milestone. It begins with two nighttime spectaculars. I mentioned one of them to you, World of Color 1. The other one is uh, um, Wondrous Journeys, which is the Castle Fireworks show um, that, that we have. Both of them are drop-the-mic experiences. I mean, we saw this past week when we were debuting it, literally people crying watching these shows. And they are so moving because they're your favorite characters, they're your favorite dialogue, they're your favorite music, but brought to life from a visual smorgasbord, the likes of which you've never seen before. And so technology and innovation and, you know, how do you create new canvases? And that's what the parks do, you know, create new canvases for storytelling. So that's the first part of it. We also opened up on Friday, officially, uh, a a new attraction called Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway, um, which is a great family ride. Any height, you know, any of those kinds of things uh, uh, does in an area that we call Toontown. And Toontown... Uh, is also under renovation. So we opened up the attraction, the ride, but in another four or five weeks, the rest of Toontown opens, and that's going to be a breakthrough for us because we redid the entire land, um, and we redid it with an unbelievable sensitivity to families with younger children and, importantly, with the younger children, younger children of all intellectual capabilities. How do you do that so that if you know, sort of the frenetic pace is too much for one child. How do you create a respite opportunity for that child and the family? So we created things like picnic grounds and real grass that you can sit in and you can sit down and your child can run around and play and mom and dad could, you know, sit and, you know, have a beverage and all of that kind of stuff becomes really an easier way to look at a Disney theme park experience in maybe a more relaxed way. So we are so excited to open up that new land which again becomes part of this celebration. We've also redone or are redoing right now um, at California Adventure, we have an area called uh, uh, um, Paradise Pier. And and one of the things that we're doing is we're redoing the entire thing. It's right now reflective of San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Great. But it has no connection to Disney, what we call intellectual property. So we decided that we would convert that space into an area called San Francisco. And San Francisco is from a movie, Big Hero 6. And the favorite character in Big Hero 6 is a guy by the name of Baymax, which is a caring robot that takes care of the health needs of young children. And what an interesting storytelling 
device that is, and, and we're incredibly excited to open that up this summer, which, again, I think will be big. In the meantime, Baymax is flying over that Castle Fireworks show that I told you about. He's flying over the castle as kind of a precursor to that land opening. So wow. I think that'll be super fun, you know, as we go forward. And then beyond that, we have a new parade that's coming out uh, in just a couple of weeks called Magic Happens, which, again, going back to pandemic, it was a brand new parade and people loved it. And we ran it for 13 days and then the pandemic hit. So we're bringing it back okay. three and a half years later. And that's going to be another great, exciting thing. And, and again, beyond all those things I just told you, so many more over the course of the year. Well, no one, no one does parades the way you guys do parades. I mean, they're just every parade I see or have seen throughout the years have just been phenomenal. And we always look forward to them as a, as a family, you know, and that's, and that's a big, a big thing about uh, what you're doing. Um, you know, I saw the parade float the other day and Ernesto de la Cruz, as an example, right. has his own float. Oh, wow. And he's up there playing the guitar. And again, this is back to, you know, the relevancy to all audiences. How do we make sure that, you know, even among the Hispanic audience, we have relevant product that has people wanting to come and share their culture, you know, with their family and learn about other cultures. That's right. At the same time. That's right. What other future plans can you share with us about the resort? Well, I think the, the, the biggest thing that we've talked a lot about is, so where does Disneyland, 68 years young, go from here? Yeah. And when, when, when I got to Disneyland, I had a bias already built in that was Disneyland was landlocked. As I've learned over the course of the last couple of years, that is so far from the truth. We have plenty of land. What we don't have is what I'm going to call the entitlements to build things mm. on the land that we own. And, and, and that goes back to an entitlement contract agreement that we did with the city of Anaheim 25 plus years ago. Okay. And at that time, it made perfect sense. As you go forward and the way people consume product today, they want things to be more integrated. They want a theme park next to retail dining and entertainment, next to parking, next to a hotel. They want all of that integrated and we're not allowed to do that on the available lands that we have. So we are having fantastic conversations with the city um, and working through all of the different things to create a new entitlements agreement that will then lead to, I believe, further expansion for decades to come, which is incredibly exciting for not just Anaheim, but it's incredibly exciting for the residents of Anaheim because that's new jobs. That's yeah. new revenue that comes into the community. That's new, a new reason to come in. And by the way, that doesn't just affect Disneyland. That affects hoteliers, mm -hmm. small business owners, restaurateurs, suppliers, all of uh, those people that, that are part of the ecosystem. You know? and, and by the way, it also helps schools and parks yeah. and things of that nature. So we're really excited about the, the potential of what I'm going to call substantial expansion of the Disneyland Resort. Well, that's exciting. We love we love to hear that. Economic development is obviously one of our three pillars as a as a chamber, and uh, we know how much uh, extra money comes into the coffers for, for the whole county. It's not just yeah. a, not just Anaheim, which is great, but it's the whole county, all southern all of Southern California. So we really appreciate it. Well, we're running close to what time? How much more time do we have, Paul? A couple minutes left. Okay. Well, is there anything you uh, we haven't covered that you'd want to share with the us today yeah the, you know the, the the one thing that i think we've been working really hard on is i'm going to call it listening right you know you know as you can expect disney you know and disneyland in southern california is a magnet for people's opinions and for coverage and all of those kinds of things and we listen very intently to what people are saying we do an enormous amount of market research we do an enormous amount of talking to our guests and our cast and listening is a big part of what we do. One of the things that we've heard a great deal about is pricing and value. Mm. And so we are really focused on that and making sure that we're communicating that there are different opportunities to come to Disneyland and experience a really valuable uh, um, um, day in the park or days in the park. You just have to make sure that you're, you're looking for the different angles. I'll give you examples. So our pricing 
you know, I've, I've read recently, you know, you, a day in the theme park is $179. Well, we have many days that are $104. We have, if you buy a seasonal pass, days that are $73. If you buy an annual pass, days that are even less expensive than that. Right. So the affordability opportunity is really important. And by the way, even among the Hispanic audience, we hear that affordability and value is a very important thing for them to uh, um, be motivated by right. as, as they think about a trip to Disneyland. So that's one of the areas that we're very focused on. That adding other value besides price is also part of it. We just announced recently that we're um, doing park hopping two hours earlier. Oh, so if you're nice. park hopping... Now you don't have to wait till 1 o'clock. Now at 11 o'clock, you can flip over to one of the other parks. And again, our two parks are so close together. You know, in Florida, you got to get on a bus yeah. and you got to go through yeah. that whole thing. Here, the intimacy of Disneyland really makes that special. And all of our guests now that come to our park get free digital downloads of what we call attraction photography. So all those memories, Ruben, that you were mentioning before, now that's on your phone and you can do what you want with those as well. So, again, there's so many more of those kinds of things available and coming, which, again, is designed that, to have that balance of let's make sure that we're giving a great experience that we're proud of, that is unlike anything else in the world, and that there are value opportunities for our guests that want to tap into that. Well, that's fantastic. And, you know, uh, Ken, want to thank you, Ken Potrock, president of Disneyland Resort, for being here today, being our guest today. And I want to thank uh, – you, on behalf of Disneyland, all of the, the colleagues that we've gotten, the cast members we've gotten to work with throughout the years, you guys have been just phenomenal partners for us, for the Chamber, and we look forward to the continued partnership that we have with Disneyland Resort. Yeah, so. much more to come from a Hispanic Chamber perspective, and much more to come from an economic development perspective, and much more to continue to reinforce the welcoming place that we are. Thank you, Ken. And thank you to our audience for listening to our, our podcast because our community is your community. Well, there you have it. All sorts of good reasons to tune in each and every time here to meet our community, the Hispanic community here in Orange County. Powered by the Orange County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio, streaming live from our studios here at the University of California Irvine's Beal Applied Innovations Center.